So good to see you in the house of the Lord. Anybody know what today is? It is Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. And this song, as, they, as he came into Jerusalem, they were singing Hosanna, laying down their coats, all this, and then the next week crucified him. But we're going to sing Hosanna to the King this morning. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Come on, put your hands together with us. He could have chosen a life of luxury. After all, he was the king of all kings. He could have called on the mightiest armies. But he chose to live and die that we might be set free. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands, our hearts to God. Open this service up by welcoming him that was called Hosanna. Uh, glory to God in the highest. Let's just express that today. Father, oh, how blessed we are today to be in your house, to love you, to honor you, Lord, together with your people. Lord, any two or three agree, and you're in the midst of us, and we know according to the word of God, you are here, and you are among us, Lord. I pray today that everything done in this house and beyond, Lord, would be for your glory, for your honor. Every song, Lord, every word, every prayer, let the name of Jesus be exalted. Hallelujah. We bless and praise you, Jesus. Lord, individually, let us invite you to do a work in our hearts today. Lord, just like so many years ago, you entered into Jerusalem as we come and celebrate what we refer to as Palm Sunday, as you made your triumphant entry into Jerusalem that day, 
Lord, make that same triumphant entry into our lives and our hearts. Let us make a way of praise before you, for you inhabit the praises of your people. And I pray, Lord, that you would do in us the work that needs to be done to make us more like Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Give him a hand clap of praise in this house, would you? Amen. You can be seated in the house. If there's any children left in here, I think we've about uh, got them all pointed in the right direction. They head on back for Children's Church this morning. But we are delighted to have you. What happened? Where is everybody? What? Yeah, spring break. Well, Lord, I need to pray spring break and the car breaks down next year. And just... <laughs> People need to buckle down, be in church, amen. Lord, we're missing a lot today, and it's good to see you in the house of God. Hey, we're here, right? Amen. amen. We're here, Jesus is here, so that's all that matters. Amen. Let me give you a couple of things, and then Brother John is coming up, because he loves to be up here doing preliminaries and things, but I want to give you a couple of things. Uh, Pastor Jim Lasseter of Cobtown Holiness Church wanted me to uh, remind you, if you don't already know, or to announce to you that their um, Christian Fellowship Days are coming up, or Christian Fellowship Week, they call it. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, out in Berrydale at the Horse Stables every year, they have a week of fellowship and ministry, preaching, singing. Uh, they have groups come in. Kevin Spencer and others will be there this year. It is April the 8th through the 13th. And so if you uh, are to where you can attend that, it would be wonderful if you could. And um, is Sherry out there? Oh, you come on. Y'all been here before. Is Sherry out there? She'll be here later. So she invited. I just want to make this clear. She invited a whole crew of people, and she's still going to drag up in here late. Oh, foot. She's getting it when she gets here. Oh, I'm just going to tell you. Amen. Amen. Well, I... It, I can't do that with everybody, but a few people I can. Anyway, uh, just want to remind you about that. If you would like to attend uh, uh, Christian Fellowship Week, Coptown Holiness uh, hosts it. It is at the Horse Stables in Berrydale, April the 8th through the 13th. Uh, you can find it on Coptown Holiness's uh, Facebook page, and you can certainly be a part of that. It is a great time of fellowship. They're doing mullet, fish fries. Uh, all sorts of things. All the details are on Facebook. Make sure you pay careful attention uh, to that. And now, without further ado, Brother John, get on up here. Give him a good hand. He loves, <laughs> loves, 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 loves this. Now, a special treat for those of you that don't know, because I'm saying this publicly, so I'm doing it. I'm doing it. In April, we have another fundraiser. Well, no, that's not what it is. We're going to be having a fish fry and a cake auction, but that is also National Youth Day. Yes. So our youth is going to be doing the service, and Brother John's going to be preaching the message. Yeah. yeah. I don't do it all. Yeah, no, 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 no. He's been trying to shove it off on some of these young men in the youth group, and they're going to be doing devotions and things, but... Our own youth pastor is going to be bringing the word that day, and he's so thrilled about it. And so, you know, praying nothing. We already prayed about it. God said, yes, you can. And so, anyway, we've got a youth fundraiser for youth camp that is coming up, so take it away. Brother. All right. Well, it's that time again. We are preparing for youth camp. Young people, go ahead and stand up and scatter around the back of the church. But we're doing our envelope fundraiser today. Um, we have envelopes. We have 100 envelopes. I don't know if we have 100 people here this morning, but we have 100 envelopes numbered 1 through 100. So if you would like to help sponsor our youth camp, um, grab an envelope. If you get a low number like number 1, number 2, number 3, uh, you can, you know, even 30, you can grab another envelope. I uh, can't promise what number that's going to be, but whatever number you have in the envelope, we're asking for you to donate that amount for our youth camp. Um, we will be going uh, to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, uh, June the 1st through the 6th. So this is going to be a week full of fun, yes, but it's also going to be a week uh, to grow spiritually. Uh, last year when we went, uh, our youth had an amazing time. God did lots of great things. Uh, during that week, 
So we are anticipating another great week. Come on up to the front. Yeah, hold your hand up high. You see we've got a lot of envelopes left. All right, how many? We still got some envelopes left. <laughs> we got a bunch. You, oh, I've already got one. Do you want an extra one? Raise your hand. Oh, you are the winner. All right, we got a few left. How many we got left? Hold your envelopes up. You gonna vote? Did you even give any away? Okay, perfect. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much for helping. We appreciate it. Again, we'll have envelopes next Sunday as well for Easter Sunday. But uh, please be in prayer for our youth camp. Um, it is, like I said. It is a great time just to have fun, fellowship, um, just grow closer with our young folk. But also it is a, it's a spiritual trip as well. So um, like I said, God did great things last year. And uh, we're expecting him to do even greater things this year. So thank you so much for your support. Oh, I love to pick on folks, and I, I, I didn't, Brother John. See, he always does a great job, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. Yep, he does. Amen. Well, um, we will have the rest of those envelopes available next week, so um, for those people that normally sit beside you when we give them out next week, I want you to elbow them real hard and say, you could have got a lower number if you come last week, so whatever number you got, we, we may go in there and add higher numbers in there before next week, I don't know. Anyway, but uh, that's an amount that you can donate, and uh, it really helps us between that, the cake auction, and our kids are going to be raising, doing their own fundraisers. Um, I can say from experience, uh, from last year, so Sue and I were able to be there and to help them, and I'm telling you, God moved in that cabin as, as we had services. I'm going to tell you, it was, a, it was an amazing time. And yes, there's some fun involved, but the most important thing is that they... Uh, get away from their normal activities so that God can speak to our young people. Amen? And so anything you do to help in that, um, I, I guarantee you it will have eternal fruit and eternal benefit. Let me give you some prayer requests. If you've not picked up a prayer card, uh, please make sure you do that as we try to update that every week. Most weeks it's updated uh, unless there's some extenuating circumstances. Uh, but be in prayer for Kairos, our prison ministry. Uh, is, today is the last day. Is that correct, Sister Dibin? So you're by yourself today. Brother Dibin is up ministering. And so pray for him and pray for the Kairos ministry as they wrap up today. Uh, God has been doing some amazing things, some great fruit and testimony out of that ministry. Uh, so keep that family. Keep one of our missionary families in prayer, as Brother Glenn mentioned, Wednesday night. Uh, for those of you that weren't here, though, the Buck family, um, they are our missionaries. Uh, one of the many missionaries we support are missionaries to France. And his wife, Kristen Buck, and um, the mother of their four children passed away this past week from complications with breast cancer. So please lift this, fa lift this family up in prayer. Also, uh, continue to pray for the Goodman family. Uh, many of you in here know Sister Nell Goodman, brother and sister Goodman, uh, who pastored in this community for many, many years. Uh, she has been a blessing to so many um, uh, ministering. She has spoken here. She has spoken in our, uh, our women's ministry, our senior adult, Sister Nell Goodman. She went home to be with the Lord this past Wednesday. Um, and that funeral service will be tomorrow at uh, Central Chapel, which many of you remember uh, was Words of Life. Uh, the service will be there tomorrow, visitation at 12, funeral at 1, and then she'll be buried back up here at Harvest. 
And so please keep the Goodman family in your prayers. Also continue to pray for Brother Avon Fowler. Um, he did get to go home. That did go through, right? She told me they were going home. But he's got a lot of fluid build up, yes. Uh, so please keep Brother Avon in prayer. Actually, uh, him and Sister Deborah have been sick. She's gotten sick since she had him at the hospital. So please pray for them that God would touch. Sister uh, Joan's daughter, uh, Michelle Barnhill, is in a hospital in Fort Walton. I saw her this past week uh, on Thursday, actually, uh, in liver failure. Has a lot of health problems, but please lift her up. And also Sister Joan as well. She is sick today and not on the organ, which we hate. Um, so please lift her up in prayer. Uh, Brother Steve Mayu, dealing with heart issues, lift him up in prayer. And also, uh, many of you know Sister Clara Kitchen uh, and her daughter, uh, Brenda Wilson. Many of that family has come here. Uh, Sister Brenda Wilson went home to be with the Lord. And so they're making arrangements today, I believe. So please lift up Sister Clara Kitchens and all of this family uh, as they need a touch of the Lord. And Brother Leonard, Sister Tina heard uh, are sick. And so uh, they need a touch as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's a whole lot of needs right here. Yes, ma'am. Her Alzheimer's has dropped down to another level that she only knows a handful of people now. And hopefully we will get to bring her next Sunday. So if she acts like, you know, if she doesn't know you, just don't be surprised because, um, you know, because if you tell her, you know me, then it confuses her. Yeah, yeah. But hopefully she'll get to come next Sunday with us. Amen, yes. yeah. So let's lift up Sister Barbara Cito. She is such a precious, yes. precious soul. We love her, and uh, she has certainly battled a number of things. So be in prayer for her. Yes, ma'am. Paulette Ganey now has infection. Where she Thank you, Fred. I meant to mention her, yes. She is in some Fear. She Fear is. Pain. Yes, pain. definitely, definitely. Thank you for reminding me. I know she's on our regular prayer list, but um, uh, yeah, I prayed with her uh, a couple days ago. Um, she was considering going to the ER at the time. They think she's got an infection. She's not healing from her surgery. Uh, so please, please lift her up in prayer. Amen. How many believe God's able to touch all these needs? He is. We, we've experienced it. We've testified about the healing touch of God lately. God's been working miracles right in our midst. I mean, uh, you know, testimonies of cancer that, that was verified and then cancer not there. Um, I'm telling you, God's answering prayer. Let's not get discouraged. Let's continue to believe God. Amen. Stand one more time on your feet and let's just go to God in prayer and believe him to touch every one of these needs. Lord God, we come to you. Because, Lord, you're the author and finisher of our faith. And, Lord, you said that we could bring our needs, our petitions to you, that we could come to you, that we could cast our cares upon you, for you care for us. You care for us, Lord. You said to come unto you, all that are weary, heavy laden, burdened, you'd give us rest. And, Lord, I believe today there is rest for the weary soul. I believe there is healing for the infirmed body. I believe there's salvation for the lost soul. There's love and compassion for the broken. Oh, God, I believe you can do beyond what we're asking today, for your word has promised that, exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think. So, Lord, we lift these needs up to you. They are many. Lord, they are many. And, Lord, there is a lot of issues around us. Lord, our world is in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. Our communities are in trouble. Lord, families are struggling. Lord, but I believe you're the healer. You hold all things in check in the palm of your hand. You're the great God. You're a mighty God. And Lord, I believe all things are possible with you. So Lord, we believe you to touch these needs. Touch, Lord, whether in the hospital room, whether in their living room, their bedroom, Lord, whether they're, uh, Lord, in this house or beyond, anywhere, I believe you can heal. I believe you can touch. I pray, Lord, that you would not only stir us within this building today, but God, those that are in our streaming audience that are not able to be here, those that watch and listen from other places, I believe today you can meet with them in a special way. So we lift up our hearts to you, and we thank you, God, for what you've done. 
because you are worthy today. Hallelujah. Let's love and worship him this morning. Can we do that? See on a hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life. Grace flowing from His side. No greater sacrifice. Sing it. What He's done. What He's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is dead.
thankful for what he's done for you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, keep those hands going. Look what the Lord has done, amen, and what he's going to do. Come on, sing it with us. Come on, put your hands together.
I'm thankful for this next song and the message. It says there's a new name written down in glory. And hallelujah, praise God, it's mine. Hallelujah. There's, there's nothing greater than to praise God for than what this song says, that our name is in the Lamb's book of life because of the blood of Jesus and what he's done. Come on, sing it with us. Worship the Lord. You can be seated as long as you don't sit down in your spirit this morning. Come on, worship the Lord.
Give him praise like you mean it this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we're just thankful for the identity that we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your unmerited favor, that wonderful grace. We, by Christ, have a new name written in glory. Lord, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether right now live or in the future, listening to this service, watching it, Lord, I pray that we would just examine, let the Holy Spirit examine us to make sure our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Old things passed away, all things become new, a new creature in Christ. And Lord, I pray that if anybody cannot say that, that they know, that they know, that they know, that their names are written in heaven. I pray today, God, that would change and by your Spirit, you would convict Search our hearts, Lord, and speak to us. Let us be changed into the same image from glory to glory. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, for your anointing, God. I know that I am absolutely helpless and hopeless without you, incapable of anything eternal. But Lord, great Holy Spirit, speak through us, speak to us, and Lord, let your word come alive. Let the convicting touch of your spirit reach every one of us today. Whether saved or unsaved, I pray that we would be convicted, convicted of our lost condition and our need of a savior, convicted of our neglect of the things of God, convicted, Lord, of our apathy, Convicted, Lord, of the fact that we're not as much like Christ as we should be. And that goes for all of us, Lord, and I'll stand in front of that line. Change us into the same image from glory to glory. We thank you, Lord. Do an eternal work in this house. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, ladies. Oh, what a wonderful time of worship today. Amen. Amen. It's such a sweet, sweet experience to be in God's house, to worship together. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter number one. Stand with us if you're physically able. John, chapter number one, the Gospel of John. We're going to go there, and then we're going to go over to 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> the Gospel of John, chapter number one. I'll give you a moment to get there. Very familiar verse. We've been dealing with uh, subjects similar to this on Wednesday nights as we've dealt with uh, working through Genesis. And we talked last Wednesday. If you were not here, I would encourage you to uh, listen to that message uh, at least uh, as we talked about an atmosphere for life and how everything exists within a spe specific environment to live. Uh, the fish can't live out of water you pluck a tree up uh, uh, and pluck its roots out of the ground, it ceases to have the nutrients, it withers and dies. And the Bible said that God created us in his image. Amen. Remove us out of the presence of God and we shrivel up and die. There, it can't be any other way. You may physically be alive, but you will never be spiritually what God intended you to be unless you stay connected into that vine in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning, uh, and I just called this, what, it's really a question, what have you become? What have you become? John chapter number one and verse number 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. That's the phrase I, I want to draw your attention to. We beheld his glory, 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, if you'll notice in most of your Bibles, there's a portion of that in parentheses. If you read it without the parentheses, it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. The word was made flesh, dwelt. The word dwelt means tabernacled, just like the Old Testament tabernacle or the tent, if you will. The word, the eternal word of God became something tangible, fleshly, a person, and he tabernacled. It doesn't say he, he built a permanent structure. No, he was here temporarily in that form. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. But John, by the leadership of the Spirit, makes sure that we understand how we can know this. For he says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He says, in other words, we know the word dwelt among us because we beheld his glory. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. We'll begin reading in verse number 5. Thinking about beholding his glory. Are you there? 2 Corinthians 3 and 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Just stop and lock into that a minute. Your sufficiency is of God. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration, at any time, if you're holding a King James, the word ministration there means ministry. He says, but if the ministry of death written and engraven in stones, talking about the law, because the law pronounced death to those that could not keep it. Nobody could keep the law completely. And we found out, according to Paul, that the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. So he says, but if that ministry of the law, that Moses bringing those tablets of stone, written and engraven in stones, was glorious... It had glory. There was glory to behold there in that law. He said, if that was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, that was only temporary, how shall not the ministration or the ministry of the Spirit be rather glorious? We read of the Old Testament and we read of the experiences that people had, things that people experienced. Moses coming down off the mountain with having been in the presence of God and the glory was so uh, radiating from his very uh, face that he had to cover it up because the children of Israel couldn't even stand to look at it. It was too much. If that was glorious, he's saying, don't you realize that the glory that we can experience by the Spirit because of Jesus is even more so glorious. Yeah. All right, you, you got that together? We, we, we on the same page? Verse 9, for if the ministration or ministry of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. You had one, the, the law basically could do nothing but condemn. It could not deliver but he said, then there came a ministry of righteousness by the Spirit because of the work of Christ, and it exceeded in glory. Verse 10, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. Now, to bear, just to clear that up, he said, that was glory, but it has no glory compared to what we can have. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, what hope? In experiencing a glory that exceeds all of those prior experiences. Seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face 
that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. He's saying, Jews, you read the same stories, but you, you the, the veil was, t- was rent in the temple, but you've still got a veil on your own heart and mind. You won't see what God wants to do with your life. He said, that veil was done away in Christ, verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, the word it there, when, in other words, when one, when an individual Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The scales from off the eyes you can understand and see. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But the heart of all of this is in the final verse of this chapter. But we all, but we all. He said in verse 16, nevertheless, when one shall turn to the Lord, the veil's taken away. But then in verse 18 said, if you can enter, if you can understand, if you can experience this, he says, we all with an open face or an unveiled face, beholding as in a glass or in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are changed, changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I would ask you to just lay your Bibles on this particular chapter because I want to deal with some things in it and just place it there by you. We'll come back to it in a minute. I want to talk to you about what have you become. You can be seated this morning in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. What have you become? Every, every one of us, every one under the sound of my voice, now or in the future, must realize that you are becoming something. My mother likes to tell me uh, that uh, she can be crabby and difficult because she has earned it. She said, yes, I'm becoming more crabby. And she says, I can I'm old enough now, she said, that I have a right to it. Sister Sylvia, you didn't have to amen to it, but okay. I I mean, you know. She has become, she admits that she is becoming more difficult as the years roll on, and she is okay with that because she declares she has earned it. But regardless of where you find yourself or think yourself to be on the timeline of history, of age-related things, you you got to know, though, regardless, you are becoming something. And of course, the, the heart of what we want to say this morning is, is that you are either becoming more like Jesus or you are becoming less like Jesus. There, there is no middle ground. There's no maintaining. There's none of that. You are either becoming more like Jesus or in a lack of diligence, you will slowly drift to becoming less like Jesus. Because guess what? Without Jesus, you are rotten to the core. And I love you. Because you see, I'm rotten to the core without Jesus and biblically, you have to love me. You may not like it, but you have to. Thank you for that vote there. So here's the thing I need you to see. We are all becoming something. The goal is to become like something better. We mimic our lives after people uh, that we see in our society. We want to be like this one, want to be like that one, want to be. Let me just tell you something. Uh, You might as well just lay all of those temporary heroes aside because in some way, shape, form, or fashion, they will fail you. But you see, I know know a man. (laughs) I know somebody that you can pattern your life after that has already lived and he lived perfect. He's already died and he died perfect. 
He's already defeated death and he rose perfect. He's already ascended back and he ascended perfect. He is seated on his throne and he is a perfect ruler. He has sent his Holy Ghost to live in us, his own spirit, and that spirit is perfect. So let me just remind you, if you want to become something, become something worth becoming. We have, I don't believe that the human race has ever lived in a time. And a matter of fact, I'm very confident in saying it hasn't ever lived in a time where there's more self-help resources uh, than has ever been. You, you can find uh, channel after channel on YouTube and everywhere else of how to better your health, how to better your mental health, how to better your diet, how to better your finances, how to better your home. You can DIY this, fix this, do this, become this. But we have also, I believe, never lived in a time where mental health has been more of a problem. We live in a time where we've got more focus on helping people with their mental health and their emotional health and trying to stabilize people. And get, but yet we're at a time where anxiety and depression and mental health issues are at an all-time high and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. And all we seem to be able to do is to be able to medicate it and numb it so people can survive. That's not the answer. I'm not throwing stones at medication. I'm thankful for all that happens and all that is able to be accomplished. I, I, I guarantee you, I, I got nothing against that, I promise. I, I'm all for anything that helps us and, and, and can allow us to, to, to keep going and all of that sort of thing. I'm not against any of that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we are living in a time to where fixing the problem is predominant. But actually fixing the problem is not. You, 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 we've got more, more resources and less results. But I want to just tell you that goes for the church as well. Because what I see across the board is we've got more resources than we've ever had. And we've got less results than we've ever had. We've got more studies, we've got more groups, we've got more fads, we've got more ideas than we can shake a stick at, but yet we're seeing less and less results on a spiritual level. Men and women, uh, for the most part, are not digging in and becoming like Christ. We're just maintaining a Christianity that we've envisioned, but we're not becoming. But let me just remind you that if you're going to fix the problem, and if we're going to address it, and we're trying to tell children that they need to have better health, well, let me tell you something. We created this monster as a society because we told them they were not created in the image of God and they had no reason to exist. We were told, or we told them rather, that they just basically evolved out of a lower life form and then they see their own lives. They have nothing to look forward to. They have nothing of origin to be proud of. They have nothing to say, God made me and God loves me. And we've undermined that and we robbed everyone from the understanding of their loving creator. And then now we want to wonder why why mental health is at an all-time critical level. We wonder why young people and young adults can march into places and murder mercilessly without any remorse, with blank stares on their face, and sit in a courtroom if they even live through the experience, and sit there without a single expression, and we wonder why. It's because we told them and programmed them that life had no value. We rob it out of the womb. We rob it out of society. We can at will eliminate whoever, and there's no repercussions. Why? Because we told them it had no value. But let me tell you something. The Bible is telling us that we are to become something. Let me ask you, what have you become? What have you become? What have I become? Can we say today that I have become more like Jesus? Or have, do I have to resign and say, I've just become a memorial of what should be? I want to just tell you something that God never intended for the church to be a memorial of yesterday. God never intended the believer to be a, more, a memorial. He called us and saved us to be a movement for God, for the cause of Christ. But instead, we have 
simply become a memorial. We try to remind people what we used to be. We try to raise up standards that we don't live ourselves. We try to tell people there ought to be a moral compass when we're not really sure about it in our own lives. What have you become? The Bible tells us here in, in the book of John, it says, and the word became flesh and it dwelt among us and we beheld, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld him. We, we, have, we have personally experienced him. Let me tell you something. If you want to fix the mental health crisis, I can tell you how to do it. If you want to change the society, I can tell you how to do it. Let's put a, a goal for people to press toward. And Paul said in the book of Philippians, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to know how to become something, you got to have it Example, you got to have a goal to work toward. You know, if, if you're wanting to run a, a 5K or you're wanting to do this or you want to do that, you're going to train, you're going you're, you're gonna to become. You're going to become the instrument that can conquer that task. You're going to put in hours, at least you should, and you're going to tailor your diet and you're going to do all of this stuff to become the individual that can, that can cross the finish line. How much are we applying that in our spiritual lives? You see, because Paul talks about, I run a race, I finished mine, I, 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 I kept the faith. You and I, every one of us have a course, we have a race, we have a, a, a mission, a plan that God has had for us in life, and there's going to be a finish line. The question is, how are we going to cross it? Because the Bible tells me very clearly, I'm to become like Jesus. I have rehearsed this verse over and over and over and over in the church because it keeps echoing in my spirit because it is a constant reminder that God has one purpose for your life and mine. The purpose for my life is not to preach the gospel. That is a calling on my life as I follow Christ. But the purpose of my life is to be like Jesus. That's why all the time I'm repeating Romans 8, 29. We know that 828, all things work together, but 829 says, whom he did foreknow him, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Every one of us, you are called, and the purpose of your life is not your career. It is not your hobbies. It is not any of those things. The purpose of your God made you in his image to represent him, and that image is Jesus. For the Bible said that Jesus is the image of the invisible, God. He is the manifestation of that God that you cannot see otherwise. But he came to this earth and became one of us so that I could see how God loves. I could see what God expects. And he said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Let me ask you, what are you becoming? Are you becoming like Christ or something else entirely? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. I can tell you, if I could give you a mental imagery, I know it isn't, isn't technically like this, but when you get to heaven, the doorway into heaven is Jesus-shaped. I said it's Jesus-shaped. I've never watched the show. I've seen clips of it as they advertise it, but there's some game show. I, again, I don't know the name of it, so I may, I'll may i talk ignorant and out of, my, out of my head for a moment, but all I've seen is clips of it to where one of the challenges is they have this wall of like styrofoam with shapes coming at them, and they've got to try to get their body in the shape to pass through it as it goes over, and there's different cutouts, and they got to do that, I, I, and I laugh at it every time thinking, I know she ain't getting through that. I know he ain't fitting in that. I don't know what they got planned, but that is not happening. Well, let me tell you something. If I can give you some mental imagery, the doorway into glory is Jesus shaped. You got to fit the mold. Are you hearing me? You got to hide behind the image of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that knows the way back to heaven. He's the only way you can get there. He's the only name that heaven recognizes for there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. But it is that name of Jesus. If you want to please heaven, if you want to walk in the purpose of God for your life, you got to become like Christ. You say, Pastor, that's a futile idea. There's no way I can be like Jesus. No, you can't. And that's the glorious part of it. 
because it's all a work of him. You say that I don't have to do anything. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't shuck your responsibility just yet. He says, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then when you get over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, he says, look, there was a glory of the Old Testament. Moses come down off of that mountain. He had glory on his face. He had to cover it up. The children of Israel couldn't stand to look on it. He says, but that glory was to be done away with because something more glorious was coming. That was a foreshadowing. That was a pattern. But Jesus is the reality. I said, that was a foreshadowing but Jesus is the reality and when Jesus came he came and fulfilled the law you and I couldn't keep that law we're doing good to keep it for five minutes much less for all of our lives but Jesus came fulfilled it completely lived a sinless spotless life he was a spotless lamb for John the Baptist said behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world how's he going to do that because he who is who can do no sin he did not sin he became sin for me and in his perfection, he could pay the price. What are you becoming this morning? Are we becoming more like the world? Because you see, what you feed on is what shapes your life. What you feed on, what, what you feed. I, I, I remember years ago as a kid, and, and I don't remember if it was vacation, Bible school, Sunday school, something, and uh, there was, the simple question was asked, how can a lamb overcome a lion? And the, it was a simple little thing, and it just said, well, you have to feed the lamb and starve the lion. That's the only way. And that's the same way with our nature. you got to starve the flesh out, and you got to feed the spirit man. But sadly, we're inundated with everything this world has to offer that our flesh is the one that is getting the most attention. Hello? If you don't believe that, sit still and let me preach till about 2 o'clock. And let's see, how, let's see who is screaming the loudest in your head. It won't be your spirit, man. It's going to be your stomach growling. I won't, I'd have to preach. I'm going to turn the volume up. By 2 o'clock, we'll all just be famished. We can't go a couple hours. Got to get to the... It's just a natural thing. You'll drive, uh, you'll drive uh, 30 minutes out of your way. I know I will. If I'm traveling anywhere, I'll drive an hour out of the way. If I know it'll put me by Chick-fil-A, I promise you. I, if, I, I'm just, I'll do it. Yep, okay, I don't cut an, I, I don't add an hour to the trip. I don't care. I get, I get some Chick-fil-A. I need a sweet tea, some waffle fries, Maybe a grilled wrap. I know you're getting hungry now, aren't you? Let's find out who's really going to listen today. And you see, I, we, we will call out and we will answer the cry of that flesh every time. But how often do we see it as an equal or at least, or at least equal, but more so a necessity that we appeal and feed the Spirit? We don't. We feed the flesh. And what you feed, you become. The Bible said here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, it said that was glorious. The law was glorious, but this is more glorious. And he goes on to say, he says this, he says, look, we all, we all with an open face beholding as in a glass. That word glass there means a mirror. He says, we beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. From glory to glory. You see, if we're becoming something, we must make sure we're becoming the right thing. Now, in this text, let me show you something. In this text, notice what it says. He says, speaking about those that, that, that come to Christ, he says, look, those that turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, we take that verse, and many times we think that to mean, okay, well, there can be liberty in the service. Okay, I've got a little more. You know, God can move in the spirit, move in the... That's not what that means exactly. What it means is, he says, now, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What is that liberty? He says, there is freedom to see Jesus and become like Jesus. That's the liberty. You're not bound anymore. You're not, you're, you're not hindered from it. God has invited you and I to come into his presence. Yeah. Notice what he says. 
but we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, were changed into the same image from glory to glory. We are changed into the same image from glory. I told you the purpose of your life is Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of God's Son. That's all God is interested in. If he can do that in your life, he can do anything with your life that's ne that needs to be done. But sadly, we go out and we try to represent Jesus when we're not enough like Jesus. Now, listen to what he says. We are changed into the same image. Can I tell you God wants you to become like him? Think about something. The first Adam, he was created in the image of God, right? Right? He was created in the image of God. Now, to throw just a little bit, I'm going to pull a little out of Wednesday night because I don't see many of you on Wednesday nights. And so, uh, if you weren't here, you, you need it anyway. And on Wednesday night, we dealt with the fact that when God, God created the heavens and the earth, listen to me, he created the heavens and the earth. What did he do? We saw it in, 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 as he began to put life on this planet before he created man. He spoke to, the Bible said he spoke to the waters and he said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. Right? You with me? He spoke to the waters, bring forth abundantly. He spoke to the earth, to the land. He said, bring forth abundantly. He spoke to it, it brought forth vegetation. He spoke to the waters, it brought forth all the life that is in the waters. He spoke to the, to, to, to the environments. He did all of that by speaking to the environment for which those living beings were to exist. The vegetation was to grow out of the earth. He spoke to the earth. Everything that lives in the water was to live in that water. He spoke to the water, the environment to bring it. But when he got down to man, he didn't speak to the water. He didn't speak to the earth. He spoke to himself. He said, waters bring forth abundantly, earth bring forth abundantly. And when it got down to making you and I, what did he say? Let us make man in our own image. You pull that fish out of water and it's going to die. You plunge that eagle down to the bottom of the lake and hold it there long enough, what? It'll die. It's out of its environment, right? Pluck that tree up by the roots and throw it on concrete. And for the most part, if it can't find nutrients, it's going to die. And the same applies to man. He said, let us make man in our image. The environment for life for you and I is the environment of God's presence. Remove us out of that and we die. And so man thought he could just do something different than what God had intended. And Satan tempted Eve and Eve, Adam, and they decided to eat the tree of knowledge. And God said, what have you done? You became something else. Isn't it interesting that when the Bible said that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day, he cried out, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Do we, are we led to believe that God didn't know that Adam and Eve were hiding over there in the bushes? I mean, come on. God does not ask questions for information. He asks questions for our benefit. Where are you, Adam? Do you know, there are several reasons he asked that. Why? Because when God is manifested walking in the garden in the cool of the day to fellowship with Adam and Eve, he said, Adam, where are you? He knows where these two people are, but he knows the Adam that he left there. Why? Because Adam disobeyed God, and now he has forfeited the presence of God. He is on a course to death. He said, you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Why? Because God said, you've disobeyed me, and I can't let you have access to the tree of life. Adam, where are you? Because the Adam that he created is not the same Adam that is there, no, there now, because the new Adam is dead in trespasses and sins. 
And so God said, well, we've got to run Adam and Eve out of here because we can't have them eating the tree of life and living forever in that condition. That can't happen uh, because they, they are in a fallen condition. Can you imagine giving uh, Hitler eternal life on this earth? Now, I use Hitler just because it's an extreme case and it's easy for us. But let me tell you something. Without Jesus, oh, God, don't give me no eternal life on here either. Why? Because our tendency is toward evil. Because we're falling. Y'all still with me this morning? And so Adam, where are you? Because Adam had become something God didn't create him to be. And it says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the first Adam was made a living spirit. But the last Adam, or made a living soul rather, the last Adam, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. The first Adam, God breathed into the breath of life. He became a living soul. But he died in his relationship with God. And so he was put out of the Garden of Eden. And now the last Adam, who is is Jesus is made a quickening spirit because he didn't disobey his father. He lived a perfect life and he is now the, the, the only one that can turn around and give life. Everything produces after its kind. Are you hearing me? Everything produces after its kind. I don't care what Supposed intellectuals will tell you, you don't just cross over lines of species. Everything produces after its kind. Variations, yes, but everything produces. If you're dead in Christ, guess what? Your influence is going to produce dead in Christ. But if you're alive and you're becoming more like Christ, guess what? Everything produces after its kind. Adam produced a family that started out with murder. That's what Abel murdered his brother, or uh, Cain murdered his brother Abel. Why? Because they died and they produced after their kind. And what resulted was death. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the first Adam was made a living soul, God breathed into him, yes, but the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In other words, a life-giving spirit. Adam, where are you? This is not the Adam. But when Jesus came and was baptized in the River Jordan, a voice came from heaven and said, now that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm not running him out of God. Remember, God turned around and God reversed the whole process. Because Adam was created and put in a paradise, he sinned and he was, he was uh, evicted out to a wilderness. When Jesus came to this earth, he was born and he was in a wilderness. That was the first direction he went when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit and baptized the River Jordan. The Spirit led him into a wilderness. Why? That's where man was driven after he sinned. But when he went to that wilderness, he lived his life. He defeated the devil. And then the Bible ends up showing us that when he dies and he's put on the cross and then he's taken down, he's put in a garden. He begins his life in a wilderness. He ends his life in a garden because man began his life in a garden but ended it in the wilderness. Jesus reversed all of that came out of the grave and he even told the man on the cross today you're going to be with me in paradise I'm reversing the whole thing are you hearing me the last Adam started where the first Adam dropped the ball and he correct course corrected us so that you and I now can be back in the presence of God and be alive again Amen. come on Jesus deserves a little praise Amen. now but notice what he says here he says this, he says in, in verse 18 uh, uh, of 2 Corinthians 3, but we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we're changed. We're changed into the same image. How are we changed? How do we become more like Christ? I'm glad you asked me that question because he says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. How? By the Spirit of the Lord. You say, Pastor, you're asking me, I, I, you're saying I need to become like Jesus. How do I become like Jesus? To become like Jesus, you have to behold Jesus. John 1 and 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we, be, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the root word of behold or beheld? 
Anybody? To hold. To hold on to. To study intently. To, to, to give yourself to. It says, it says, we beheld his glory. Here it says that we all with an open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Hmm. Okay. If you're going to become like him, you have to behold him. John tells us again, not only in, in, in the gospel of John chapter number one, does he say we beheld his glory, but if you go all the way to the epistle of first John chapter number one, in verse one, it begins with this. He said, our eyes have looked upon him and we have handled the word of life. He said, this was not hearsay, church. This was not something that somebody told us about. This was not something that I, I just learned in a Sunday school lesson. No, he's saying, this is something that I personally got a hold of. How do you know you're changing? Because you're getting a hold of Jesus. Listen, I, you don't have to, I don't have to try to convince you with that, or you don't have to say, well, I don't know if I'm becoming, let me tell you something. If you get a hold of Jesus, you will change. Yeah. 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 Whew. Are you still with me? Yeah. Matter of fact, go ahead and just, I, 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 want y I want us to do this together. Go over to 1 John for a moment. Let me show you something. 1 John chapter 1. The epistle, 1 John chapter 1. Oh, I got two hours and ten minutes left. First John 1 and 1, are you there? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. You say, but pastor, I wasn't there when Jesus walked on this earth. I wasn't there. I didn't get to uh, share bread with him. I didn't shake his hand. I didn't put my arms around him. I didn't see him face to face. Let me tell you something. When Thomas said, except I touch him physically, except I put my hands in the print of his nails and in his side, I will not believe. Jesus shows up, gives him that privilege, but he said, blessed are you, Thomas, for you have seen and believed, but more blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. You may not have physically handled him, but let me tell you something. You have a more glorious opportunity for by faith, you are more blessed because let me tell you something. They might have touched him. Yes, that would have been a wonderful experience, but folks, I get to love him by faith, experience him by the Spirit, and I'm still gonna get to see him face to face, and I'm still gonna get to hug his neck, and I'm still gonna get to spend eternity with him, church. We've got to behold him. Have you beheld him lately? Have you laid hold of him lately? Have you took hold of the things of God and have you really pressed in to know Jesus like you've never known him? That's the only way you can become something is to behold something. It's the only way. But he says that it, this happens by the Spirit. Notice what he says. He says, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, if you fast forward out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 into chapter 4, he tells us in verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, don't miss this, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, I wish I could have experienced what Moses did. I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done that. Do you remember in the book of Exodus chapter number 33 where Moses says, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. What does God tell him? He said, no, you can't see me and live. You can't. You can't see me and live. But he said, I tell you what I will do. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll hide you with my hand and I'll pass by. And I'll let you get a glimpse as I pass by. But that, 
But that's not what it's telling us that we can experience. Notice what it says in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. It says, God that commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where in the face of Jesus Christ. And then the famous verse, verse 7. But, but we have this treasure. Where? In earthen vessels that the excellency may be of the power of God and not of us. Now, we focus so often on the treasure, and granted, that's the centerpiece here. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. But that was not the point Paul was making out of verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of the power of God and not of us. The treasure was not the point of that verse as much as it was the vessel that was to hold it. Now, I'm not telling you that we're more important than the treasure. That's not what I'm saying. What Paul is saying, Paul is making a point. He says, look, we can behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You can become like Christ when you behold Christ by the Spirit. But, he said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why did God choose to put the glory of God in these finite, frail vessels so that the excellency may be of God and not of us. You see, because when you and I become more like Jesus, it doesn't point to us and say, oh, look how wonderful they are. No, what it says is, I know that joker. And I know what he used to do. I know who he used to be. S something strange going on here. This guy don't talk like he used to. He don't tell the same stories he used to. He don't hang out with the same people he used to. You know, he settled down. Something's different about him. Uh, did, did, did he get in a program? No, 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 no. He must be reading a lot of self-help books. Maybe he's been to counseling. Maybe he's said, no, 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 none of that. I'm not against anything that helps, but that's not eternal change. What's happened to that guy? Jesus. Jesus. We beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when they see your life becoming something that you couldn't become on your own, he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the excellency may only point to God and not to us. What are you becoming this morning? What are you becoming this morning? You, you and I, are either becoming more like Jesus or we're becoming less like Jesus. I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not trying to divert any attention away from personal responsibility. We all have personal responsibility. But ultimately, it has to be a work of God's Spirit. I could sit here and, 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 and we could go down and dissect things that we call sin and things that are, uh, you know, we know to be wrong and that we're not living our lives to please God. I could say, well, you're doing this, you're doing that. If you're doing this, if you're doing that. And we could go down all these lists. And then somebody's invariably going to say, well, you know, I don't see that as sin and I don't, I, I don't feel convicted about that and I don't see that that's wrong. Listen to me, I'm not going to have those arguments with you. Because you're not the standard and neither am I. It doesn't matter if I feel like that's okay or if I don't see that as sin or not. The standard is not me. The standard is not a preacher. The standard is not uh, Mother Teresa as people like to point to it or anybody else. The standard is Jesus. Yes. And if it's not, if it doesn't line up with the character of Jesus, then it's not going to make us like Jesus. Hello? You were created in the image of God to be conformed to Jesus. And that is only possible as you behold Jesus, you study, you take hold of him. I want to be like Jesus. The 
The sad part is we don't give Jesus the time of day half the time. Oh, sure, I mean, we really, we burn the phone line up if there's a problem. Oh, Jesus, you promised me this. Oh, Jesus, there was a scripture about this. Oh, Jesus, yeah, when the crisis comes, we burn the thing. I'm not saying we don't run to Jesus. We should run to Jesus every time. But don't wait for the crisis to make you run to him. Love him today. What are you becoming? What have you become? I will just testify and I confess my faults one to you as we, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. I'm not near as much like Jesus as I should be. I'm not living in willful sin that I know of. I'm not out running around or, or, or just trying to, you know, get by. No, no, I love Jesus, but I know, I, I know he is so wonderful. I'm not near like him as much as I should be. And the only way I can become more like him is I've got to behold him yes. more than I have been. That means taking hold of him. That means to wrap everything of your life around Jesus, that you're going to study everything about Jesus. You're, you don't know anybody until you are around them. You see people at a distance and you think this and you think that. That's why I tell you a lot of times that... that and, and I, I probably shouldn't say this considering I'm still preaching and want people to listen to the messages, but I, listen, I very rarely listen to any preacher that's not dead. And they'll re, it's not because, and there are some I listen to that are still alive and I got great confidence in, but I, I'm scared all the time. Like, well, at least this person died with a testimony and I ain't got to worry about them falling away and saying stupid stuff. You know what I mean? So I listen to people that are already dead because I feel like they, they ended pretty well. I don't know of anything dumb, and I can I glean from that. I know that's not, please don't take that. I know that's not the right way to do that. God still has people of integrity, and I, and I got it. I understand. But, folks, I, I, I want to become more like Jesus. How about you? What are you becoming? Look, look, just rewind a little bit of your life. You don't have to go way back because we all have a past we don't want to go back to. Rewind just a little bit. In, in that amount of time, maybe the last time God really dealt with you, the last time that you had one of them services where God really pinned you in the altar and you were convicted and you were, or you were just so overwhelmed with the love of God and you were, oh God, I'm going to do better. Oh God, I'm going to do more. Oh God, I'm going to draw close to you. I'm going to pray like I've never prayed. I'm going to really get in your word this time. I'm going to really serve you. Rewind a little bit to, to, to when you made those statements or had those experiences. And between then and now, what have you become? Have you become what you promised God you would? That you were going to be a prayer warrior? You were going to be a man or woman of God? You were going to be a man or woman in the Word? That you were going to serve Him even though you didn't know what to do and you're, you feel incapable and that's wonderful. That's the perfect place to be because it is not of you, it is of Him. But you promised Him. We lifted our hands and sang, I surrender all and lied the whole time we did it <laughs> because we didn't surrender much of anything. Hello? One old preacher said, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. That hurts a bit. I'm just going to, I'm just going to confess, that hurts a bit. Ouch. What have you become? I want to become more like Jesus. Yes. Musicians come. Would you just bow your heads around this place? Father, thank you for the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your mercy and grace. God, I'm so thankful today that you have been patient and kind. I'm so thankful today that you have been long-suffering. I'm thankful today, Lord, that when I've made a mess of things, Lord, when, I, when I've not done everything that I could, maybe everything that I should, I'm thankful, Jesus, that you've been patient with me. And Lord, your word says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. 
And it has been your goodness and your patience that today should cause us to say, oh God, how undeserving I am to be here. How undeserving I am today of your love and your care. But Lord, you loved me enough that today, today, you took time to remind me that you are lovingly drawing me closer to you. That you want me to experience your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That you want me to be more like you. So I pray today, Lord, let me put everything aside Whatever I need to do later, whatever's on my mind, nothing is more important than becoming more like Jesus. I pray today, Lord, that you would help us to set everything aside and just surrender ourselves to Jesus today. As they lead us in this altar service, let me invite everyone that will to find a place of prayer. You don't have to come tell me anything, talk to me. If you want prayer, I'll be glad to pray with you. But today's the day that we need to talk to Jesus. We need to let the Holy Ghost stir something in us that, hey, I want you to become like Jesus. How about we let the Lord work on those rough places today? those shadows in our lives that we've not let God deal with. Come on. Between you and the Lord, let's just lay it all out. Come on. Come on. Let's come into this altar right now without hesitation. Lord, I want to lay it out before you, Jesus. Make an altar somewhere and say, Jesus, I surrender it to you. I want to be more like Christ today. Today, I want to be more like Christ. Conformed into his image. Oh, be Jesus in me. In me, Lord.
Come on, let that be your prayer right now. Lord Jesus, take over. Take over, Jesus. Not me, but you, Lord. Just you, Lord. Sing it to him. Let it be your prayer right and now. I pray Jesus, be Jesus in me. Oh, Lord. No longer me, Lord, but me. Let your resurrection power, let it be. it is our prayer today and I pray Lord that it would be the continual desire of our hearts to be more like Christ Jesus reveal yourself to us by your spirit and Lord let us be changed from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord thank you Jesus let this question resonate in our spirits Lord in our hearts from this day forward, what am I becoming? What have I become? I want to be like Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you today. You can stay and pray fellowship as long as you like. Hope you have a great week in the Lord. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night.